For the ones who get it done, the most important part is the one you need now. And the best partner is the one who can deliver. That's why millions of maintenance and repair pros trust Granger, Because we have professional-grade supplies for every industry, even hard-to-find products. And we have same-day pickup and next-day delivery on most orders. But most importantly, we have an unwavering commitment to help keep you up and running. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Hey, everyone. Ray here. I've got your next reading recommendation. Maria Mandel was a beautiful young German girl who did not start out as the brutal, cruel woman she would become. The highest-ranking female SS guard at Auschwitz-Birkenau, responsible for thousands of deaths and even murder by her own hand. Mandel was a nice girl from a good family until she was corrupted by the Nazi machine and descended into brutality. The factors that led to Mandel from a small-town girl to one of the worst perpetrators of the Holocaust are told in a chilling new book, The Mistress of Life and Death, The Dark Journey of Maria Mandel, Head Overseer of the Woman's Camp at Auschwitz-Birkenau, a revealing book of how easily even the most unlikely person can be influenced by hate and power. Researched for two decades by author Susan Eichheit, the fabric of Maria's life is woven together here, utilizing dozens of interviews with survivors, perpetrators, witnesses, and family members. This timely biography is a chilling and complex exploration of the full extent of the Nazis' propaganda machine and its ability to indoctrinate, creating a powerful war criminal whose cruelty knew no bounds. The Mistress of Life and Death is available everywhere. Books are sold. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 450, Moscow. Dark days are coming. Last time, the opening phase of Operation Typhoon in early October saw the tearing of a massive hole in the Russian defenses. Perhaps Moscow would fall by Christmas, but perhaps not. True, Army Group Center's commander, Von Bock, had issued orders, namely that 9th Army and 3rd Panzer Group take Rezhev and Kalinin, respectively, in the north, that south of the main road to Moscow, 4th Army would charge at Maloyaroslavets and Kaluga, while Hopner headed for Mozhaisk closer to the main road, and about 75 miles, or 120 kilometers, short of the capital, while Guderian, his command was now the 2nd Panzer Army, would stay on the right wing and make for Tula, about 100 miles, or 160 kilometers, due south of Moscow. In other words, this would be the crushing blow, the beginning of the end of Moscow's defenses. And yet... Before the Panzers moved out, they had to wait for two things. First, the reduction of the two newly created pockets of trapped Soviet soldiers, and two, fuel. Thus, as the war in the East is replete with ironies and history-making moments, this was certainly one of them. The Panzers had just torn a 300-mile-wide hole in the center of the capital's defenses. Stalin was, at this moment, short of men to fill the gap adequately, and yet the Panzers did not have the fuel to finish the job. Supplies were coming up, but that would take time. Time for the newly trained Soviet armies to be thrown into the gap, and for winter to come that much closer. Stalin was needing men, but he was getting rain. And as it turned out, that was a pretty good alternative. The rain had started on October 6th, at the end of Phase 1 of Typhoon. This immediately reduced the sorties flown by the Luftwaffe, going from 1,400 to 139 in a matter of days. Next, supply trucks had a harder time of it. Thus, what they were bringing, and it was never enough, took longer and used up more fuel. Another irony. On a more personal level, it also meant that it would take longer for the wounded to be removed from the front for proper attention. But then the officers of Army Group Center received a shock when Hitler mused, out loud, of sending Guderian and von Weeks south instead of to the northeast to Kursk 
to destroy more Soviet armies there. He would change his mind and keep the course, but this shows that he was considering Napoleon's maxim of destroying enemy armies versus taking enemy cities. One can fight, the other cannot. Which turned out to be another irony. Many officers had agreed with Hitler's proposal in regards to turning some of the Panzers south. After all, they believed there was very little in between them and Moscow currently, so it made sense to eliminate even more enemy troops. But General Zhukov also saw the danger the capital was in. As he told the Stavka, the chief danger is that all routes to Moscow are open, and the weak protection along the Mozhaisk line cannot guarantee against the surprise appearance of enemy armed forces before Moscow. And his remedy was simple enough. Put whatever forces were available, no matter what their lack of training is, along the Mozhaisk line. The Soviet high command agreed and then took it a step farther by creating the Moscow Reserved Front under the command of Lieutenant General P.A. Artemev. This was now Moscow's main line of defense. As touched upon last time, Army Group Center's left flank had had its own local success during the opening phase of Typhoon. On October 10th, 3rd Panzer Group made for Kalinin, while the 9th Army was on its left flank. The plan was for them to meet up just before charging at the city, and it was a good thing they did, as the Soviet 22nd and 29th Armies fought savagely to defend it. And despite the Luftwaffe only being able to give minimum support, the Panzers did enter Kalinin on October 14th. As the city is about 100 miles or 160 kilometers northwest of Moscow, Reinhardt was now in the perfect position to help form the left or northern panzer attack on Moscow, or, if it was in his head, he could go in a more directly southern route and roll up the Mojask line that was still being firmed up and manned. But it would not be that easy. Nothing was easy about the Eastern Front. The Soviet Northwest Front Chief of Staff cobbled together two rifle and two cavalry divisions, added on a tank brigade, and sent them back to Kalinin. This contest lasted two weeks, and though the Germans still held the area when all was said and done, not only were they too exhausted to go anywhere, but the recently arrived Luftwaffe pilots watched as their new homes and airstrips were blasted by Russian artillery. Next, Zhukov took over and put Konev in command of the new Kalinin Front. It would work hand-in-glove with the capital's defenses along a line that followed the Volga River. Not that it mattered, as the Panzers came again and again, defeating those forces in front of them. No, the two pockets had not been completely reduced yet, but as the Panzers had finally been given some fuel, they were sent on ahead anyways, as Berlin sensed, like Moscow sensed, that this could be the straw that broke the camel's back. TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right, new music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. Going from north to south, here were the latest successful German attacks. The 16th Army was sent to Volokolomsk, north of the main road. The 5th Army was sent at the town of Moshaisk, just above the main road to Moscow. 43rd Army was aimed at Malaya Roslavets, about 31 miles or 50 kilometers south of the main road. And finally, the 49th Army was sent to Kaluga, about 70 miles or 112 kilometers further south than Malaya Roslavets, which put Kaluga about 50 miles or 80 kilometers to the northwest of Tula, Guderian's target city. By October 16th, all these Soviet fronts were defeated. But again, the Germans were forced to regroup, repair, and wait for fuel. Not that there was a sense of hopelessness on the Soviet side. 
Having the panzers so close to Moscow gave most Russians a new boost of energy and focus. It didn't hurt that some of the Soviet troops from the Far East were now starting to arrive in Moscow's area, like two regiments of the Siberian 32nd Rifle Division, along with the 18th and 19th Tank Brigades. For example, the Mozhysk Line had just been throttled, but as their defenses had just gone from six rifle divisions and an equal number of tank brigades and 10 artillery regiments to 14 rifle divisions, 16 tank brigades, and just over 40 artillery regiments, there was still an element of defense. Again, not that the Panzers and their crews had the fuel or energy, respectively, to continue on. And as each day went by, these defenses along the entire Moscow front grew in strength and depth. Going back to the weather, which will soon take center stage, As the rains limited the Luftwaffe's raids near the capital, the rail line between Moscow and Mozhysk stayed busy, bringing in ever more men and materiel. As for the attacks below the town of Mozhysk, namely Guderian's attack against Tula, his 24th Panzer Corps ran out of fuel just before Imsensk, about 60 miles or 96 kilometers southwest of Tula. It would get worse from there. Back in August, Lieutenant Colonel Mikhail Katukov was summoned to Moscow. This could either be very good or very bad. It was the former. He was to be appointed the commander of the 4th Tank Brigade. As he was a part of Moscow's defense, he gathered those who had fought the Germans before and survived to assess their tactics. First, he learned, the Germans would attack with their artillery and planes. Then the infantry would rush in to exploit any weakened points, but even that was a red herring of sorts. In truth, the infantry would find the weak points, and then the panzers would come charging ahead. Then the metal beast and men would trade places, and then the attackers were off and running. But, as this was their pattern, it was now up to Kutukov and company to create their own counter-tactics. Soon, the 4th Panzer Division under Guderian was approaching Orel, located about 115 miles or 185 kilometers southwest of Tula, and about 80 miles or 128 kilometers east of Bryansk. The men of the 4th Panzer, like practically every other German, assumed that the real defenses before Moscow had been destroyed. This should be just another stop on the way to the capital. And indeed, it was, as on October 3rd, Orel was entered by the 4th Division. Now, there was nothing for it but to continue to the northeast and make for Tula. But about one-third of the way to Tula was the city of Imsensk. There, Katukov readied himself and his men and greeted their incoming trains with joy as they brought in more tanks. Just before Orel fell on October 3rd, Katukov had sent a few T-34s close to the city for reconnaissance. Sadly, while Orel was falling, some panzers had moved on up the road to Tula, and they ran into those few T-34s and destroyed them. Yet it wasn't all glory for the Germans. After the sun went down, Katukov sent in a few more tanks, again for reconnaissance. He needed to know how much time he had, but those T-4s managed to take out 14 medium and light German tanks, along with five vehicles full of German infantry. A blow had been struck for the defenders. As the sun rose and reports came back to Katukov, he realized their tank ambush tactics had worked. Now, if they could just deploy them on a larger scale, and they would get that chance. And however it was decided, Katukov would not fight in Imsensk. No, he had moved out with his forces to set up a defensive line just five kilometers out of Orel. Enough Russian cities had been razed to the ground through combat. The defensive line was set. The Germans were in for a surprise. But they assumed it was about to be as it had always been. They would use their artillery and air power, then send in the infantry, and then the panzers. But Katukov didn't wait for any of that. He sent in his T-34s, and they were told 
to only focus on the panzers. One by one, those panzers went up in flames as the Soviet tank brigades were sent in and picked their targets together. They all focused on one panzer until it was destroyed and only then moved on to the next. But again, they acted as one. As surprising as it may be, the panzer crews had not been trained for tank duels, and certainly their Panzerkampfwagen I and Panzerkampfwagen IIs had no business being near a T-34. The Germans retreated, leaving behind 18 smoldering hulks. The best tank division of the Wehrmacht had just been forced to retreat. Kutukov was equally parcelated and surprised that their tactic change had worked. But what's that saying about going to the well one too many times? No, Kutukov's brigade retreated back a ways during the afternoon of October 4th. Two days later, the panzers approached them. Kutukov had a Captain Kochekov set up on a high-rise building, easy to see and be seen. Sure enough, the Germans spotted him and attacked. But that's when Kutukov sent in four of his T-34s. Or rather, he sent them in, and then back out, and then back in. The Russians were trying something, hopefully, the Germans had not seen before. As the high-rise building was being attacked, those four T-34s rushed out of a grove of trees and fired. The Germans ready to return fire, but then noticed the T-34s were gone. They had ducked into a ravine as the panzers had been reacting. Suddenly, the Soviet tanks appeared from behind a hill and fired again. As they were not spotted in time, they got off several good shots, forcing the panzers to retreat. They could hardly afford another loss as they had the day before. These panzer losses, combined with others in the area along the front, as the Russians stiffened their defenses out of sheer desperation, totaled 133 panzers lost, half of an infantry regiment, a few aircraft, and some mortar teams. Not to get too far ahead of the story, Guderian would try to rally the troops. As the road to Tula was clearly blocked, he would try to swing around. But the Soviets anticipated this, and more panzers, certainly the Mark IV tanks, were obliterated by the T-34s, as the former were under-armored. But fast Heinz Guderian could also be stubborn Guderian. He was not giving up. As he did not have enough panzers for a push across a broad front, he gathered up much of what he had left, and he would create a much more narrow front, or spear tip, to be called Erberbach Combat Group, which had among it the infantry regiment Gross Deutschland. As the road needed to be traveled went to the northeast, this unit hit the area to the north of Imsensk, and as they pushed in, given the direction that the German troops needed to go, This successful incursion soon put them behind the town. This allowed other German units to the south of this to push forward a little bit more. But between their lack of fuel and constant Soviet air attacks, these two soon came to a halt. This focused attack by Guderian loosened the Soviet defenses in front of the Erberbach combat group. That, and a screaming for constant fuel deliveries, allowed some German units to advance. As October wore on, the Germans pushed forward, not as fast as before. Besides, they were only going so far, given their lack of fuel and the now ever-constant mud. Up the road, the panzers slowly went. First, the city of Chern fell, located about 15 miles northeast of Imsensk, and on October 28th, they neared the Tula area. But, As it had taken constant airdrops of fuel, and this was hardly the killing blow Guderian wanted to achieve on Tula, the local commander was given permission to swing to the city's eastern side. Something other than a direct attack had to be tried. Another ironic twist, the Battle of Tula became an example of what the Germans wanted to do to Moscow. As the days went by in late October, more German troops reached the area, and began to spread out, now able to attack Tula from the south, north, and west. But so too were Soviet reinforcements arriving. Which equated to an intensity in the bloodshed, with little to show for it by the Germans. 
On October 29th, the German 3rd Panzer Division was five kilometers from Tula. The next day, with supplies running out, the Germans started an artillery attack and then sent in their infantry. Parts of the village of Ragozhinsky that made up one of the suburbs of Tula was captured. But an immediate, intense, and focused counterattack pushed out those 60 German soldiers of the Grossdeutschland a few hours later. The Germans would not return to Tula. Never. Not that they knew this. To be sure, the fighting here would go on and not stabilize to the Soviets' advantage until mid-November. But the writing was on the wall. Between the cold, of which the Germans were not dressed for, the mud, lack of fuel, and constant Soviet air attacks, Typhoon was coming to a halt. This was also true as the Mojesk line was all but broken, but it was not broken. This would force Hitler to focus on the flanks, as a direct attack on Moscow seemed impossible. After all, they had the territory south of the capital, at least as close as Tula, and to the north, they held Kalinin. So, good things were possible, which only caused consternation in Moscow. In fact, Stalin had learned little since June 22nd. He still wanted to attack, as if the results of Minsk and Smolensk had not happened. But Zhukov knew that the coming weather would give them time. Time to focus on the defenses along the passable roads to Moscow. There was no other way during the time of Raspustista, a.k.a. the season of bad roads, or the mud season, when the rains came. As touching the weather, another irony, the rainfall that had so hampered the Germans was actually slightly below average, and the temperature had barely changed since the last month. Such is the weather in Russia. But if October is known as the month that the Blitzkrieg came to a halt, there were two additional reasons for the month to stand out. One, reports were getting back about the treatment of Soviet prisoners by the Germans, and it was not pretty. But at least Moscow did not have to threaten anyone anymore about surrendering. The Germans had taken care of that. And the second reason that the Soviets were glad to have reached October? Not that 99.99% of the country knew this, but in mid-October, Stalin's spy master in Tokyo, Richard Sorge, confirmed that Japan would not be attacking Russia, taking advantage of its current situation. No, they would be heading south, towards the Philippines and Indonesia, as they needed certain raw materials there. Stalin finally believed someone he believed Sorge, as he had not believed so many others who had tried to warn him of Barbarossa, and soon he was giving orders. The result? A division from the Soviet Far East was reaching the Moscow area every two days by rail. By the end of October, there were an additional 13 rifle divisions and five tank brigades ready to go, and most had combat experience after the skirmishes of Nomaham or Kalkin Go. And Berlin missed this influx completely. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So let's say hi to some new members and thank some people who have donated. Um, Let's see here. Hans Rovers from the Netherlands. Thank you, Hans, very much. Jeffrey Tucker from Wisconsin. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. It's super appreciated. Nikki Vergano from Hawthorne, West Victoria, Australia. Thank you very much. Those are the latest members. They get two extra episodes of a month uh, for $5 a month. Let's see here. Donations. Let's see here. Oliver Marandi, uh, uh, Alexander Pustilnik from Austin, Texas. Thank you very much, Alexander. It's appreciated greatly. Um, let's see here. James Belcher, Belker, I'm not sure which one, and his son who live in Waynesboro, Virginia, uh, where my son lives. So James and son, welcome aboard. And it's nice to you know, no, someone's nearby. And lastly, Heather McGinty. So thank you all who have supported the show. I really do appreciate it. Um, we will continue on and get a little closer to Moscow and then go to Army Group South and then push on all three fronts, just like the Germans are trying to do. And we'll see what happens. Take care, everyone. <laughs>